Because it's all in here. Yes. All of that is in here. You're not disqualified. What, what disqualifies us is if we give up totally and we decide that the world is better than the presence of the Lord. And that's what's so easily, that's the bridge that you can easily cross. And then all of a sudden you don't even realize that you're there, but you're there. And you don't know how to cross back over. Once you cross over it, um, you become an, uh, immune to the voice of the Lord and the things of the Lord. So it's a hard, lot hard to cross back over because it becomes about your truth right. and not about God's truth. So we're hearing a lot, a lot of that. I, I'm older and we talk to a lot of young artists and writers and it's my truth, my truth, my truth. It's not has anything to do with you. Yeah. It's everything to do with him. It's everything to do with his truth and his way and, and, and what he's called us to. We've got to We've got to remember that. He didn't say this was going to be easy. He didn't tell us it was going to be smelling like roses all the time. He said, when you want the presence of the Lord, learn how it smells. So that when you ask for it and call it in the middle of your depravity and your chaos and your grief and your suffering, you know how to smell the presence of the Lord. Even if it's for 15 minutes, I'm telling you, it'll do something to you. It'll give you peace. I, I, I just like the Lord dropped, um, drew me to, to, to 2 Samuel 7, you know, when, um, is this, yeah, yeah, 2 Samuel 7, where the, the Lord decrees this thing over David. We, we use David all the time because David is the worshiper, right? And, and David's taught this and taught this and taught this, and this is after David comes into, like he learns how to take the presence of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, into the city. I mean, he's a wreck, right? He's a complete wreck. He doesn't really know how to do it right the first time. He does it all, botches the whole thing up. It's not what God wants. Somebody gets killed. And then he learns how to carry the presence in to the city, and he learns how to contain it. But And then God delivers this whole thing. And, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, you know, Nathan comes and gives him this big word, and, and the Lord's like, I took you from the pastor from tending the flock and appointed you ruler over the people of Israel. I, I have been with you, and, and wherever you've gone, I've cut off all of your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great and the names of the greatest men on the earth. I mean, he's just pouring this prophetic word out. The Lord is over David, who's just brought the Ark of the Covenant in, and now he gets to sit on the throne. And the first thing the guy does is sees a woman, has an affair, and then conspires to kill her husband. How in the world can God actually say there's anything good about this guy? When, he, when he's telling him all this stuff, but he also knows you're about to make the greatest mistake you've ever made. Yeah. You're going to conspire and have a man killed so it hides your affair. Yes. And this is the guy who God said gets to sit on the throne. Yeah. And David's depravity and in his, um, in his way of, of departing from the truth didn't mean that he was excluded from the presence of the Lord because God doesn't give a prophecy or a declaration over somebody that's going to cross over the bridge and not come back. Yeah, and I need you to understand that there are so, we, this is what we're in danger of. We're in danger of a whole different belief system coming sweeping in because the enemy knows if I can get them beyond this point where even though they've been declared over, they forget the declarations yeah, yeah. altogether yeah. so that they never come back over the bridge because it's a lot harder to cross back over yeah. on that bridge. I, I I, just, I've seen it over and over and over and over. Yeah. My sister's first husband, 18 years of marriage, five children, man of God, man of God. Loved the Lord with all of his heart, wanted to serve God with all of his heart, but started to let his mind erode with rebellion and pornography and all kinds of things. And he became so vile that he crossed over that bridge, destroyed his family, destroyed his name, and ended up with nine stab wounds in him after he tried to assault a woman and break into her house. And it's a dateline midnight television show. Jesus. But I'm telling you, it's like what our family has faced in realizing, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. When you can't get over, what does that say about the family? God stood up over those five kids and said, not on my watch. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so there's this, this reconciliation where the Lord will stand to defend when, when 
people want to depart, they can depart, and the Lord will grieve as they depart. Right. But I'm telling you, there's a disease in the house of God right now where the enemy's voice is becoming louder than the Jesus. Lord's voice over some of us and trying to get us to believe a truth that has never been the Lord. And I believe it's because we're on the verge of something amazing. Yeah. That yeah. shaking that William yeah. talked about last yeah. night. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about Hagar in Genesis chapter 16. And I mean, when you, uh, these are stories like, I don't know if you read this, this stuff. But this stuff will change your world. Yes, it will. Yes, yes, yes. If we're going to talk in modern day times, Hagar was the first trafficked woman trafficked by a Christian woman. Wow. Mm -hmm. Sarah had her trafficked out to her husband because Sarah was so disappointed because God hadn't opened her womb. Wow. And so Sarah put this thing on this other woman, and Hagar ends up fleeing because of the absolute mistreatment that Sarah had given her. A, a woman of God. Yeah. 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 And God sends her back to her misery. God meets her and says, you got to go back. And this is Bible times. Remember, this is the beginning of the age. This is the beginning of the stories of the ones that are coming. This is the building of people and tribes and all of these things. And so it's a very different time. No counselor would ever tell a woman to go back to her, her husband like that. In this day and age, nobody would. In that day and age, it was completely different. God tells her to go back to her misery. I mean, it's shocking to read that as a woman. But she's the only human being in scripture, a trafficked woman who gets to name God. And he looks at her and he sees her and she says, you're a Roy, the God who sees me. Yeah. No other human being gets to name God except for Hagar, the trafficked woman in scripture. And so God gives her something that he gives her the license of her freedom by saying, you're the only one that gets to hear this. I see you. And she said, God sees me and I have been seen. And she girds up her strength and she returns back to the thing that God says because he's put something in place that has to happen in order for the generations to be what they are. And so if we didn't have a Hagar, none of y'all would probably be sitting here. Because God had declared something. And so in every generation, in every time zone, in everything, it has to occur. But you have to be in the line of obedience to do it. No matter what it costs you. No matter what it costs you. You have to be in the line of obedience. Now God will never call us to this anymore, hopefully. We don't live in Bible times. Thank God. My, my son says this is the most brutal book he's ever read. He's, he's correct. Yeah. If we think it's bad, it's not bad. Have you read this book? It's bad. We don't live there. We live under new covenant. We live under freedom. We live under the spirit of this sovereign Lord who sent his son to die for all of us and to take on our mourning so that we can learn to dance more than we learn to mourn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a time and a season for everything, people. But I'm telling you, you have to get your mind and your heart and your spirit in line. And it may cost you everything to do this. Yeah. Jesus. It may cost you everything to do this. I, I, I think about um, Second Kings and Elisha and how Elisha just comes to this this town all the time and there's this wealthy couple in Shunem and, and it's, she doesn't have, doesn't have a name she's just the Shunemite woman yeah. and she's like hey we're wealthy we have a house let's remodel the house build a room for Elisha anytime he comes he can just stay with us we've traveled enough that we meet Shunemites we stay in the Shunemites home all the time she doesn't need anything. She doesn't talk about her needs. She doesn't say anything to Elisha at all. She just is generous and kind and she does what she can because she doesn't want to talk about what it's cost her to believe in God. Yeah. Yeah. So she's laid that on the shelf. And Elisha's like to his servant Gehazi, what can we do for these people? They're so kind to us. Like they've made us this room upstairs. What can we do to these people? Yeah. And 
Gehazi says, well, I know they don't have any kids. And so Elisha gives her a word. And he says, this time next year, you're going to have a son. And she says, no, 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 no. There's a line in this household of promises unfulfilled. We're not crossing the line anymore. Mm. Thank you very much, but I don't need that. It's mm. literally what she says to him. Yeah. Because she had grown to a place where it right. cost her so much, she'd stopped her expectation yeah. of God ever coming. Yeah. But Elisha can't become who he is without her expectation coming back on fire. So that he gets to do what he gets to do. So that it's written about here. So that you guys can continue going on. Yes, yes. So God's trying to tell us, look, expectation of loss and stuff where you're holding the promise back. But I'll serve the Lord. But I'm just not going to expect anything from God anymore. Because I've been down that road. I mean, we're not even going to talk about it anymore. Because when I talk about it, I start... I, I, I can get about a little angry and I don't want to get angry at God because I love God he's amazing I love the presence of the Lord he's amazing yeah. this is kind of this woman's thing yeah. she has a baby and I mean and her expectation is now on fire right yeah. baby's three out working with her husband in the field grabs his head must have a brain aneurysm and they bring him back to the house and he dies in her arms and I love her I mean you gotta read this story she lays the boy down gently and she calls her servant and she says, saddle me a donkey. And she rides out to see Elisha and her husband says, well, why, why are you going, why don't we just send word for him and he can just, she's like, it's okay, everything's fine. I don't even think the husband knows that the baby's dead, honestly. Yeah, right. He's fine, everything's fine, everything's good. And she gets out on that donkey and Elisha sees her coming and says, hey, that's the Shunammite woman. Go down there and make sure that everything's okay. Why would she be coming to us? So Gehazi goes down there and he says, Hey, my master's asking, is everything okay? She's like, it's fine. Everything's great. I have no business with you, she says. Mm. I'm going to the one who gave me the promise. Walk the word. The one who gave me the promise needs to bring the promise back to me. Because yes. I'm not doing another season of desolate. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. This is what she's doing. Yeah. When she gets to Elijah, she falls at his feet. And she's like, you're the man that gave me the word. You're the man that's going to go back to the house and resurrect the boy. Yeah. Which is exactly what he does. Yeah. And can you imagine? I mean, if you read this story, you can almost see the trembling in Elisha. Because all of a sudden, his giftings got a cost. Wow. Yeah. And his stories emerged with her story. And her giftings on fire. And now his giftings on fire. And there's a cost to what the presence of God at all times yeah. makes sense yeah. in our chaos. David knew how to bring the ark in, but he wasn't mature enough to understand the weight of it at all times. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a weight in the presence of the Lord, and it doesn't keep you from chaos. Right. And it doesn't really keep chaos from you. It's the song you sing in the middle of the chaos. Yeah. Sing, O oh barren woman, you who never bore a child. Greater are the children of the desolate than she has a, a husband. There's not really a great line in there. And sing, sing like you have something when you don't. That's what scripture said. Go ahead and sing. I mean, you don't have it. The womb is barren. You've had a hysterectomy. There's no way you're ever going to birth the baby. But go ahead and sing like you have it when you don't. And I, I, I grappled over that verse so often. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you're missing the point. The power is in that one word at the beginning of that scripture. Yes. Sing. Sing, sing, O barren woman, you yes. never watch For greater are the children of the desolate. Something breaks off of us in our worship. Yeah. It doesn't make the weight feel so weighty anymore. And if you've never sang in the middle of your agony, try it. Yes. If you've never shouted or, or read scripture in the middle of your agony, try it. I mean, it may not it may not help you for three days, but it will help you in that minute until you start doing it again. Right. Until you start doing it again. I'm just gonna say this really quick and then we can just go back into worship and just being desperate for the Lord. But two and a half weeks ago, um, 